Hello everyone. Welcome to HIM 225. In this lecture, we're going to begin covering chapter 18 in your textbook, Diseases of the Digestive System. In ICD-10, it is chapter 11. Um, as always, I want to encourage you to go over the abbreviations and acronyms, the glossary definitions, and then to also look at the chapter review and the workbook assignment that you have for homework before you begin reading the chapter. You'll notice in looking at this chapter that we don't have any um, ICD-10 guidelines for uh, chapter 11 in ICD-10. And in reviewing the guidelines for 2021, which came out last October 1, there are no um, additions to um, that. So there are no guidelines for this particular chapter. Take a look at the section list. It's not particularly extensive. And in going through your textbook, um, many of these conditions are things that might be diagnosed on an outpatient basis, certainly not all of them. Um, ulcers are discussed on page 436. Gastrointestinal hemorrhage is discussed on 437. And what I want to make sure that you look at is the difference in the terminology for, the hem for hematoschesia and hemochemesis. It bleeds in the lower GI tract um, are usually detected through uh, blood in the stool, bright red blood in the stool. That's called hematoschesia. If the bleed comes from the upper GI tract, patients are usually vomiting blood. And they may have melina, which is dark stool in blood or occult blood in the stool. And the occult blood is found through a laboratory inspection. And um, the patients have to be worked up to know whether or not uh, there's an upper or a lower GI bleed. Um, occult blood is usually typical of a malignant neoplasm in the colon. So when you reach a certain age, you're provided with a, a, a specimen collector that you can actually apply stool to, and you mail it in typically, and they check it for occult blood. As long as it's negative, you're good. But if it's positive, then they want to find out why you're having occult blood in your stool. Um, GI hemorrhages can have many causes. Uh, the most common one has to do with gastric or intestinal ulcers, hemorrhoids, diverticulitis, and angiodysplasia, which actually is a malformation. Um, when a patient presents with a GI bleed, they often will perform a procedure called an EGD, esophago-gastroduodenoscopy. And the EGD, um, they look at the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. And a lot of um, that will often help them determine what the source of the bleeding is. Um, if there is a, when there is a causal relationship, of course, certainly you code to the greatest specificity. Um, there is also, of course, a code for uh, melina, hematemesis, and if the patient has an additional finding such as gastritis, that can be coded as without hemorrhage, and that would be when they performed that EGD. So sometimes they'll do an endoscopy and it will not show any active bleeding, 
Um, if the physician documents GI bleeding based on the patient's history and other findings, it is acceptable to assign the code with mention of hemorrhage or a code from category K92, even though there may not be any active bleeding at that particular encounter or at the time that EGD has been done. Appendicitis is discussed on page 438. This is a diagnosis that typically uh, results in an appendectomy or a, a resection of the appendix. They, they'll often say excision of appendix, but it's not an excision. They typically take out the entire appendix and you will, you can see that when you look at the operative report. Uh, patients can have appendicite, uh, an appendix that ruptures, and then they can develop a peritoneal abscess. They can go on to develop gangrene of the colon if they have a ruptured appendix and they, they don't get it treated. And people used to die from that because they doctors were not readily available, surgery wasn't sophisticated enough and patients would have a ruptured appendix, they develop a peritoneal abscess, gangrene of the colon, and then they would die from that. Hernias are discussed on page 438. Hernia repairs may often include the placement of mesh. If that is the case, then those procedures are coded as a supplement, and we're actually going to go over procedure codes in this lecture. Um, Crohn's disease, ultra, ulcerative colitis, gastroenteritis are other common diagnoses from this chapter. On page 440, your textbook discusses intestinal obstruction and it actually has some uh, diagrams that um, show you um, examples of different things that cause obstructions. B is adhesions. Sometimes when patients have had multiple abdominal surgeries, they develop scarring in the abdomen and those scars are called adhesions. And adhesions can cause bowel obstructions. And with patients that do that, the more they do surgery, the more adhesions they develop. So if they have a patient who is developing um, adhesions, they really try to do something other than surgery to treat them uh, because they know that the condition is just going to continue to work and worsen. Diverticulitis and diverticulosis are discussed on page 441. And it tells you that a diverticula is also known as a tick. It's a small pouch in the lining of the mucosa of an organ. And these happen in patients. Um, so if a patient has diverticula, the, the has diverticula, it's referred to as diverticulosis. If those pouches become inflamed or infected, it is diverticulitis. So they're very different. Diverticulosis just means they have them, but diverticulitis means that they have become um, inflamed or infected. Patients with diverticulitis can have uh, peritonitis, they can have perforations, fistulas, bowel obstructions, abscesses. Sometimes when patients have colonoscopies, they will biopsy these diverticula and find that the patients have colon cancer. That's one of the very uh, common ways that colon cancer is identified. Um, if a patient has diverticulitis and they have diverticula, you only assign the code for the diverticulitis. Your book tells you that this is an acute condition. They usually treat it with antibiotics. However, I have known patients that have had severe diverticulitis and they have ended up having a colon resection. Or they will have, um, they will go in and take down the colon and create a colostomy and allow the bowel to heal and rest and then they'll go back in and, and hook it back up. 
uh, cirrhosis of the liver, degenerative disease. It can be treated um, many ways. Commonly, cirrhosis develops as a result of um, alcoholism. Um, hepatitis is discussed. And then we come to cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. Um, this is uh, quite common. They say if you're fat, female, and 40, that you are probably going to develop cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis is when you have gallstones. So stones in the gallbladder. Usually it's asymptomatic. Unless one of those gallstones blocks the cystic duct or the common bile duct and it doesn't allow the gallbladder to drain the bile that it creates. When that happens, patients develop acute cholecystitis or they can have um, obviously cholelithiasis with that cholecystitis. It's a very, this is a very painful condition. Um, sometimes if patients lose weight very quickly and they're on a very low fat diet, they may develop um, cholecystitis. It says it's often made worse by ingestion of fatty or greasy foods. But I can tell you that I had, we had patients that went on these liquid diets and one of the known complications of that liquid diet was developing cholecystitis and we had patients that did and had to have their gallbladders removed. Now when the common bile duct is blocked, patients can develop cholangitis. And if the stone um, uh, is blocking the lower end of the bile duct, um, <clears throat> that's when the stone is blocking the lower end of the bile duct. Patients can also develop pancreatitis if that common bile duct is blocked. Cholidocolithiasis. A blockage with a stone lodged in the common bile duct is cholidocolithiasis. An ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, may be done to detect the presence of gallstones. So there's a specific procedure that they perform to see if the patient has gallstones. So sometimes the patients will have a cholecystectomy and an ERCP done at the same time. And this tells you that in I-10, it's important to look for documentation of where those gallstones are located. Are they in the gallbladder? Are they in the bile duct or both? If the patient has cholecystitis and it's acute or chronic, you need to know that. And whether or not there is uh, stones that are obstructing and where cholangitis is present. So we're going to take a look at these codes. Okay, so if we look up cholecystitis, we can see that the default code is K81.9. This is in a category four cholecystitis. Um, and this is, um, we have a code for acute cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis. Then we have a combination for acute and chronic cholecystitis. We do have a use additional code here. It tells us to use an additional code if there's gangrene of the gallbladder or if there's perforation of the gallbladder. You can see that if a patient has cholecystitis and cholelithiasis, so that they have an inflammation of the gallbladder as well as stones in the gallbladder, it's a different category. It's category K80. So when we look at this um, entry in the index, we see cholecystitis with calculus stones in common bile duct, and it tells us to see calculus bile duct with cholecystitis. Um, cystic duct, gallbladder, cholidocolithiasis, cholelithiasis. We have gangrene of the gallbladder, perforation of the gallbladder. Then we have the acute with, and then chronic with gallbladder calculus, with obstruction, chronic, with acute. So 
be careful when you're coding in this category to thoroughly read the entries. Now, I want to look at cholelithiasis. Okay, so if we go to cholelithiasis, um, it tells us to also see calculus of the gallbladder. We can see cholelithiasis of the bile duct, the hepatic duct, specified NEC. So let's look at, I want us to look at, this is C, and anytime you see that instructional note in the index, you need to go look, even if you think all the codes you need are right there. So if we go there, what we can see is that we it's calculus if we go to calculus we see bile duct common hepatic k80.5 with calculus of the gallbladder cholangitis with cholecystitis acute chronic so what i want to do is go and look at uh, these other categories um, let me go back to chapter 11 for just a minute and we're going to go into disorders of the gallbladder. And you can see that we have a category for cholelithiasis, cholecystitis. Then we have other diseases of the gallbladder, the biliary duct, and the acute pancreatitis code. So let's look at cholelithiasis. Okay. <clears throat> now, there's an excludes note one here for a retained. This is a retained stone after a cholecystectomy. Um, then we have uh, gallstones with acute cholecystitis. So the patient has cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. Um, it tells us to use an additional code if there's gangrene or perforation. And you'll notice that the codes are divided as to whether or not there's obstruction. So if we have gallstones and Acute cholecystitis without obstruction, K80.00, and then we have a code with obstruction. Then we go down and we have codes for gallstones with chronic cholecystitis without obstruction, with obstruction, and then we have codes for gallstones with acute and chronic cholecystitis with and without obstruction. So you have to read these um, very carefully. You'll notice we also do have a code for gallstones without cholecystitis. And there are people that live with gallstones and don't develop cholecystitis. So it'll be sometimes an incidental finding when they do a CT of the abdomen. They'll say, oh, well, they've got gallstones, but they don't have any symptomatology, so they don't do anything about those gallstones. And then we also have co uh, the subcategory for a stone of the bile duct with cholangitis and again we have um, with and without obstruction um, acute cholangitis chronic cholangitis acute and chronic cholangitis and then calculus of the bile duct with cholecystitis and again those same groups of codes so you have to be very careful with these terms they sound alike so when you're looking at the documentation, you may just want to make sure that you write down each component of this disease process so you code those appropriately. Pancreatitis, this is the category for pancreatitis in the index. Pancreatitis can very often um, be fatal. Patients die from pancreatitis. And so when you're looking at this category, you want to make sure that you review it very carefully. You'll notice that these codes are based on um, with necrosis, infected typically throughout. Um, so make there's an acute, there's a chronic, and so make sure you look at those codes carefully. Now, your question for this lecture is number is exercise 18.5, number seven. Exercise 18.5, number seven, and it's on page 444. And you will have one more lecture that covers procedures and
of the homeworld.